My name is Denver Supinger, the proud chair of the Young Adults Advisory Council. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance of the Young Adults Advisory Council, further known as the Council, we need to make certain findings and determinations for the record. It's a bit cumbersome, so I ask for you to ask for you in advance for your patience. First, because each member of the council is participating in this meeting from a separate location, we must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and appropriate volume for all other members. Accordingly, I am going to conduct a roll call. And I ask each council member participating in this meeting to state your name and location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you can hear your colleagues. Following the roll call, we will vote to establish that Every member can be heard and that the quorum is present. So I'm Denver Supinger calling in from Fairfax. Muhammad Rahman. Sarah Bufano. Kiana Simpkins. Sarah, Sarah just indicated she's running just a little bit behind, but she'll be joining us in, I think, about 10 minutes or so. Wonderful. Kiana Simpkins. Casey Judge. Casey Judge calling from Falls Church, Virginia. Wonderful. Natalia Moody. Holly Moody calling from Winchester, Virginia. Oh, hey, Winchester. All right, shoot a cupola. Sujit Coppola calling in from Vienna, Virginia. Thank you. Anna McCoy. Diego, Diego Rodriguez Carrera. Carrera. Melanie Marie Stover. Jessica Sun. Son calling in from Vienna, Virginia. Great. And then uh, Dini Muhammad. Dini Muhammad calling in from Annandale, Virginia. Great. Thank you. At this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to one of my fellow council members, Casey Judd, so, um, so that I can be heard and make a requisite motion. I move that each member's voice can be adequately heard by each other members of the council. Is there a second? Second. Second. All those, oh, I'm sorry. This is my job. <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. Motion, motion carries. Wonderful. Second, having to establish that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels us, uh, compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used, and how we are arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state emergency caused by COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for the council to physically assemble and unsafe for the public uh, to physically attend any such meeting. And as such, FOIA's usual procedures, which require physical assembly of the council and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or, particu uh, or particularly. I further move that the council may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated video and audio conferencing line, and that the public may access the meeting through registering through, uh, through the meeting link on the Young Adults Advisory Council website at www.fairfaxcounty.gov backslash economic dash initiative backslash young dash initiatives dash advisory dash council dash YAA or by calling 1-844-621-3956 and entering access code 173-987-2877. It is also Do I hear a second? Yeah. Do I hear a second? Someone's unmuted. Any second? You've got a second. Oh, all right. Thank you. All those in favor <laughs> say aye. Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. Finally, it is uh, next to require that all matters addressed in today's agenda must address the emergency itself or necessary for the continuing of uh, Fairfax County government and or statutorily required or necessary to continue operations in the discharge of the council's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. It is so moved. All right, you all were provided an agenda from our lovely staffer. Are there any um, edits to the agenda or concerns? All right, hearing none, the agenda is so 
adopted. Um, and um, did we have any public comments in advance for this meeting? Did not. No. no. Okay. Then we have no public comments to address. Um, I don't see any public attending, but of course they are willing to watch. They are able to watch us at two a.m. if they wish, um, and give us their comments later. All right. Well, this meeting has adjourned. Good evening, everyone. I hope you guys are having a great May. I feel like I just saw you two days ago, but it's great to see your faces again. We're going to start off with our pr uh, presentation on Fairfax County strategic plan, um, which hopefully will open a few doors and insights on what the council can do to be part of that initiative and to push us in the right direction. I believe we have Anna on the line. Great. Hey, everyone. Um, thank you so much for the, the chance to talk to all of you tonight. Um, as Graham mentioned, um, you know, this work lives in terms of Fairfax County government in the Department of Management and Budget, but it's really been um, an initiative of the County Executive um, and of the Board of Supervisors. Um, and it started back in 2019. Um, and so for tonight, I just wanted to provide you all with a really sort of high level, broad overview of why we have a strategic plan and, and how we got to the point we are now. Um, but I think even more than that, you know, throughout this process, we've recognized the importance of connecting with younger people, um, but also, you know, recognizing some of the challenges when it comes to engaging folks because Sometimes, as your intro, you know, just demonstrated, it can seem like an overly bureaucratic process. Um, and so, well, part of what I think we would love to hear from groups like yours is, um, you know, how we can do a better job of communicating the plan so that it connects better um, with what matters to people, especially young people, sort of within the context of people's daily lives. And what are some more creative methods that we can use in the future um, to make that happen? Um, and so this presentation that I'm sharing tonight is really focused on, as I said, why we have the plan, how we got here. But I also see this really as a way to um, start some better and more interesting conversations in the future about the priorities in the county, um, both now and in the future. And um, also, you know, how we can, as I said, do a much better job of engaging folks who might not normally participate in something like the strategic plan. Um, one process note, um, the actual strategic plan is actually still in draft form, just in case you're not aware of that. Um, and I did post in the chat just um, where the strategic plan and all the related documentation and stuff can be found on the website. Um, but what we expect is that, you know, since the Board of Supervisors have approved what we're using is the 9 priority areas for the plan in concept. Um, we don't actually expect them to take action on the plan until October. Um, and so the good news about that is there is a lot of time um, and there's a lot of plans for more discussion and opportunities for input before the plan is actually finalized. Next slide please. So, 1 just general thing to note is that Fairfax County has never actually had a countywide strategic plan. Um, so, really, the 1st conversations that our leadership had were around why we needed 1 um, in the 1st place. Um, and really, there are a couple reasons. Um, number 1, we thought that it was important to be able to articulate. A more clear and compelling and exciting vision for what the future of Fairfax County could look like to people both inside the county, but as was mentioned, you know, sort of when, when we got online, you know, what would attract young people to live here, to work here, um, to want to, you know, basically grow their lives here? How can we make it look like a place that's not only, you know, stable and well run, which of course we all know that it is, but but how can we do a better job of even marketing Fairfax County um, out to the outside world? Um, the second, I think, is the need for much better integration sort of across the board when it comes to, to Fairfax County government. 
Um, I think that everyone is aware that Fairfax County has a lot of programs and services that are available. Um, and we also a lot of countywide initiatives, but I think that what's not always obvious is how all these pieces um, fit together. Um, and also how they're aligned with the way our leadership decides on how they allocate resources to these different priorities. So I know you're connected with the Department of Economic Initiatives. And so one example of that is the COVID economic recovery framework. And so as these initiatives come up that are responding to events in our community, how can we make sure that we're aligning those types of initiatives to everything else that's happening so that both the board um, can look at them sort of more, more holistically and how, you know, the community can kind of understand, you know, how these things relate to each other. Um, the third is focus. Again, the board and the county leadership are constantly inundated with budget requests. Um, and so how do we help them to chart the right course over the short term in addition to laying out this longer term vision? Um, and fourth is progress. So how can we be more clear about the community outcomes that we're driving towards? So what are the community conditions that people most want to see? Um, and also, how can we um, highlight the areas where we're meeting the mark so that we can share our success with the community? But how can we really take that a step further and maybe highlight some areas where we still have a lot of work to do? Um, you know, I think the county, again, has a reputation for being well run and that was that was hard earned. But I also think that sometimes, you know, we are not as transparent as we could be in terms of the issues that we still have facing us that need more attention. And so really showing our our progress and kind of in some cases our lack of progress. Next slide. And so we have these guiding principles that we followed and I think that most are probably fairly self-evident. Um, but the first one I wanted to just highlight is the equity lens. Um, you're probably familiar with one Fairfax, which is the county and Fairfax County Public Schools racial and social equity policy. Um, and so what that means is that the county has committed to looking at equity in everything we do. Um, and in practice, what that means is looking at every decision that's made in the county, or at least starting with the major decisions that are made in the county to see how these decisions either benefit or burden certain people in the community or certain places in the community. And so one Fairfax is sort of the, the lens that we use to look at the way that we are, you know, making decisions and, and developing policies in the county. And so then the strategic plan is kind of meant to be the operational home. So where recommendations come out of something like one Fairfax or the COVID economic recovery task force, we see the plan moving forward as a way to operationalize all these great ideas altogether. Um, and then taking this a step further, really looking at these places and these populations and making decisions, um, especially at a systemic level that eliminates some longstanding barriers. Um, and part of that is because, you know, when we look at Fairfax County on average, you know, it looks like a great place to be and it absolutely is, but we want to make sure that we're not obscuring some pockets where we still have a ton of work to do um, on the equity front. Next slide, please. And so finally, just some of the themes that we focused on throughout the development of the plan. Again, I think these are all fairly clear, but I just wanted to highlight um, two of them. The first is affordability. Again, at the beginning, I heard, you know, comments about how expensive Fairfax County um, is and continues to be. And so I think that that's a main theme um, that came up throughout the plan. Um, number one, for young people starting out. Also for people, you know, that that sort of disparity between people are at the highest rung of the economic ladder and then those folks that are struggling. Um, and then the recognition that on top of that, COVID has made um, that affordability concern even more acute. And so that is definitely a, one of the themes that we're focused on, I would say, most strongly. Um, and then the second is innovation. You know, as we said, I think that it's safe to say that Fairfax is great at a lot of things, but I don't know as we're known for being particularly innovative. Um, and there's a lot of reasons for that, but I do think that COVID has given us a push in the right direction, um, just even in terms of the way that we use technology to be more efficient. Um, but we also do recognize that we still have a long way to go. And we're looking, you know, for creative ideas, both in terms of 
of how we can foster innovation in the community and then how we can become more innovative and responsive um, as a county government. Next slide, please. Okay, and so these are the nine priority um, areas that you may have seen, and these basically provide the framework um, for the countywide strategic plan. Uh, we collected a lot of feedback um, to get us to this point, um, but I think that when we look at these and when others look at these, they're fairly, again, self-evident in the sense that they're, they basically encompass, right, um, anything, anything that we think we would want to focus on in county government. Um, but, you know, I would very much encourage you to look at the sections of the plan that include the areas that most interest you. And I would say that for um, this team, it might be economic opportunity because that's really shaped around how we as a county can really support people, places, and businesses thriving. Um, and, but of course, there's a lot of detail in there in terms of what's specifically proposed. Um, but full disclosure, I was the team lead for the economic opportunity team during the first phase. And so my background is in workforce development and some economic development. So I would really um, welcome your um, willingness to engage on this in the future. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and so this slide just really shows a high level timeline of just the really major milestones in the plans development. Um, and so, as I mentioned, we started in early 2019. Um, and so just a few notes. So the, the development of the plan was done by nine teams, essentially. So for each priority area, we had a team. Um, we were really looking for diversity in these teams and across the board. So meaning we were looking for folks who may have been um, with the county for a little while, folks who were brand new to the county, people who were very early in their career, people who were in their mid-career, um, to try to really use the strategic planning process as a way to um, help our workforce with professional development. Um, and for us as a county to be able to do some succession planning by giving people some exposure and some development through this process. And I think that it very much um, succeeded in that respect in a lot of cases. Um, and so these teams worked again under the leadership of the county executive and the deputy county executives, as well as the chief equity officer. And so basically we, we went through a very deep dive where we researched these, these nine areas and we talked to as many people as possible, um, subject matter experts and others, both within and outside the county. Um, we developed indicators of community success. So essentially identifying what are the conditions the community most wants to see. Um, and then we drafted strategies um, as well as metrics to see, you know, how we're moving in the right direction. Um, and again, also highlighting areas um, that, where we still have work to do. And I would say that what's different, you know, I've been with the county for almost 20 years, shocker. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, I've been through a lot of strategic planning processes. And I think that sometimes, you know, there's such... Um, a risk of making something completely formed uh, before we bring it out for input. And I can say that this process was the best that I've seen in terms of, you know, us getting something to a certain point, but then really listening to what people were telling us and making adjustments. And that's something that we definitely say is continuing throughout the life of the plan. Um, next slide, please. Okay. And so um, this essentially brings us to 20, 2020, 2021. And so the proposed plan was first presented to the Board of Supervisors in February, 2020. So obviously COVID hit a few weeks after the county executive presented the plan. Um, and so the expectation at that time was that um, we were planning to pursue board adoption of the proposed plan concurrent with the FY21 budget. Um, but because of COVID, the decision was made to pause just our public process um, so that the board and the county could really focus on these new budget challenges um, and also issues of continuity of government operations and emergency response. Um, so we used that time internally to really take a new look at the plan sort of in our post-COVID environment. Um, and what we found is that 
surprisingly, I mean, I think that the plan was designed to be high level and long term enough so that it could adapt pretty easily. Um, but I think that COVID seemed so transformative at the time that we thought we would kind of have to really go back to the drawing board. And I think that what we found is that the plan itself mostly maintained its relevance, but where we needed to make adjustments was just in the context, right? So um, Black Lives Matter, national issues of racial justice, public safety, um, you know, affordability issues. Those types of issues had really come to the forefront. And so we wanted to make sure that in the plan, we were, you know, communicating with the right tone relative to what the community was facing, even as a lot of the strategies that we had put together again were high level enough to still be relevant. Um, and so once we updated the plan, it was represented by the county executive to the board of supervisors this past February. Um, and so, as you hear, see here, the star represents roughly where we are on the timeline. Um, the Board of Supervisors did request another round of community engagement, um, which you can see here is anything, you know, that says new. Um, and so we plan to, again, reach out in as many ways as we possibly can. And so some of those ways are going to be um, a series of community conversations with a continued focus on really reaching people who may not normally participate in this kind of process. Um, information Q&A sessions for BACs, that's boards, authorities, and commissions, um, as well as county employees. Um, and then once we get all this feedback that we're getting kind of from a, a lot of different directions, we're going to be analyzing it for trends and then putting that feedback together so that our leadership and the board can figure out where we need to make adjustments prior to seeking final adoption of the plan um, in October of this year. Uh, next slide, please. And so, as I mentioned, you know, all the information about the plan is um, online and will continue to be updated. Um, Fairfaxcounty.gov forward slash strategic plan. Um, but again, I really want to make sure that we are not just sort of in a very static way putting information out, um, that we're actually engaging with folks and especially, you know, younger people who, again, may not have participated in these processes for very good reasons. <laughs> and so I think that what we want to do is make it easy for folks to provide feedback. Um, and so once you, you skim the plan, um, if you haven't, you know, glanced at it already, I definitely encourage you to reach out to me directly with any uh, feedback or ideas you have, um, because clearly we have a lot of formal channels that we're going to be using, but we also want to make sure that we're having conversations because I think that ultimately, um, once we move to plan implementation, it's not going to go very far if we haven't really um, done our full due diligence to hear from, from everybody who normally talks to us and, and in addition, folks who, who may not have in the past. Um, and so my door is open. You can reach out to me anytime. Um, and of course, I'm more than happy to answer any questions or comments you have today as well. All right, I'll open the floor to questions, comments, insights. I had a question, if you don't mind, um, in terms of yeah. your, your timeline, when are you looking for feedback from our group by? I know it looks like the fourth, yeah, yeah. fourth round is kind of concurrent with going back to the Board of Supervisors. So when should we right. have our feedback to you? So I think that, you know, um, as I mentioned, I think that we wouldn't want to kind of stop feedback at any point. So we want to keep it fairly open ended, just in the sense that if at any point you look at the plan and you have anything you want to communicate, just let me know. If you're looking kind of more formally to maybe get together as a group and provide feedback, um, you know, I think that. We can do that a number of ways, um, and I think that the sooner the better is always the case. Um, so if you're able to do that within the next couple months, that will give us enough time to sort of look at that feedback within the context of everything else we're hearing um, and maybe to share that with the board, because I know that, you know, the board, obviously you're you're in these roles for for a good reason and. Um, you know, all of you obviously wanted to hear feedback from all of you, but also any other groups you may be connected with that you, you know, would like to provide feedback as well. Um, and again, this is just kind of an informal method. We've done three surveys. We, you know, we have all this other feedback, but this is just another way 
um, you know, for, for folks to provide general comments. So I would say, yes, I know that's probably a non answer, but, um, but yeah, I would say the sooner, the better, if it's formal and if it's informal anytime. Great. Thank you. Sure. Hi, Amy, this is Jessica from Providence district. Thank you so much for coming and giving this presentation. Uh, I was just wondering, like you mentioned, and I think that's really awesome that uh, there is a, a big effort to try to reach out to folks who may not normally be involved. I was wondering what are some of the ways that uh, you have already tried to reach out to those groups, um, like maybe parents of FCPS students or, you know. Right. Yeah, and so, you know, we work very closely with our one Fairfax team, um, you know, our chief equity officer, Carla Bruce, um, you know, she and I are like constantly figuring out what the best way is to go about this. And so we did a lot of outreach um, and actually, if you're interested in any of the details, I'd be happy to send you because we did share that with the board recently. But yes, parent liaisons through FCPS, working with um, neighborhood and community services, um, working with the health department, so basically trying to meet folks where they are. And I'll say that one of the challenges that we've had is that, you know, um, even though we got a lot of general feedback about the plan, and that's definitely informed the plan, I think that once we move sort of more into the implementation phase, we're going to want to keep getting feedback, but we're going to probably want to have it more focused on the priority areas themselves as opposed to the strategic plan, right? Because, you know, any one of us, we may not want to go to a meeting about a strategic plan, or maybe folks who are really, you know, interested would do that. But probably the majority of people would would be much more inclined to provide feedback to us on education, public safety, you know, like all these different um, priorities within it. And so, so yeah, so number one, I can definitely share with you the specifics because if you see any, if you don't see anything that you think would be a good strategy, I'm all ears. Um, and, you know, we're all, I'm sure in different ways trying to, to do those same things. And so if there's anything that's in there that, you know, all of us can learn from, that would be helpful too. So I'll send that to Graham if that's okay. And you can say, yeah, I would love that. Thank you so much, Amy. You know, I'm a daughter of immigrants, so I, I, I really love this effort to reach out to folks who may not normally be involved. So I'd love to see, you know, how maybe there's a new perspective I could provide. I don't know. So thank you. Yeah, that would be great. And actually there is an inclusive community engagement group that one Fairfax has been championing championing championing. Um, and so that group has been, again, these are public, um, you know, they're like really folks that are on the front line, right? So community health workers and folks like that. Um, and so that group has been put together to do exactly that. But I think that, again, it's one of those things where we want to make it easy for people to provide feedback, not cumbersome, right? And so I think that sometimes when we're putting ideas together, we're like, we need to do these thousand things and we lose sight, you know, of can we ask folks three questions that will give us a lot of the information we need. Um, so again, yeah, when you look at the, the outreach that's been done, if you have other ideas, please share. Um, Cause again, I think, I don't think that any one group or person has all the answers, but it's definitely something that I think we're all pursuing. Absolutely. Thank you so much again for coming and presenting today. Absolutely. Thank you. Hey, Amy, um, thank you for your presentation. I'm, and I think I called you Anna earlier, so I apologize okay. for that. No worries. Uh, I know there's a focus and you say here there's a close partnership with one Fairfax, but to my understanding, it's a director and then two staffers. So it's a really short, like small shop taking mm -hmm. on the equity work of a county of 1.2 million people and with the major mm -hmm. issues that we have before us. Mm -hmm. So how reliable is that? Are there other partners that we're using to have that equity lens and recognizing the limits of that one department? Denver, that's such a great question. And so, yes, yeah, so Carla Bruce is our chief equity officer, and I think she might have five or six folks in the mix, but I think we all recognize that that is nowhere near close to getting to the critical mass that you're talking about, right? And so a couple of different things. Number one, um, Chairman McKay did a task force on equity and opportunity. And that brought in a lot more folks in the community to make recommendations. And so again, to the, like the connecting the dots piece, all those recommendations, again, they need some operational 
home so that they can actually happen, right? And so that's one way the recommendations that come out of that, we're looking to integrate those in the strategic plan. The other thing is that, you know, part of the equity work is not to keep it contained, you know, in the county executive's office. And so there is a very involved group. Um, so every department has um, an equity lead and it is very robust in terms of the training that these folks are getting and um, the network that's being built. And so um, it's very expansive and impressive, I think, just in terms of even within county government, what we've been able to do. Now, again, I think that reaching out of the county government is, is some of what, you know, Carla has really been working to do. And so, again, that stands as well. I think that a good place to look at maybe um, some of the um, outside folks that are involved would be to look at the members of Chairman McKay's task force on equity and opportunity. And if you can't locate that, I'd be happy to shoot it to you. But um, that might give you sort of an idea of some of the folks that are involved. But if you have ideas too of you know groups that you know would really add value to this work, I know Carla is extremely open as well, um, and would love to hear those suggestions too. Great, thank you. I would reiterate what Amy what Amy mentioned about the uh, the equity leads. Uh, we have in, in DPD where you know, Casey and I work. We have not only. Um, a, a one equity lead, we actually have two, and then within each division, we have equity leads. <laughs> so it's very, there's a very robust structure um, that's that's there to help implement um, our equity plan, which we also have. So we're in, in concert and, and in consultation um, on a pretty regular basis uh, with, the, with the one Fairfax office, which is great. Right, it's great. It's long overdue. It's been wonderful. Mm -hmm. Are there any other questions from the floor? Carrie, okay, we thank you so much for your time and for providing this. I think we're all ready to dive deep into the strategic plan and, and get together and give some feedback and insight. So thank you so much for taking your evening to be with us. Absolutely. And as I said, reach out to me anytime for items big or small. I feel like that's the only way we're going to really make this happen. So appreciate all of you for taking your time to listen, even if it's a little process heavy for seven o'clock in the evening. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Talk to you soon. Bye bye. All righty. So I'm going to hand this over to our wonderful staffer uh, to give us an overview of um, meetings and changes of COVID 19 and what all that looks like um, since we are so used to meeting virtually. So, Graham. And it's actually changed even since um, I sent out the agenda. <laughs> okay. <laughs> as, as you as you know, everything changes very quickly these days. Um, but I, I did want to mention um, something that is is kind of on the horizon um, and and remains on the horizon, even though the horizon has been uh, extended. Uh, but right now, um, we per the Code of Virginia, which is just the state the state law. Um, under FOIA, we have to we we were able to meet virtually. We we're able to do WebEx. We're able to do Zoom, we do a phone call uh, as a group, um, but that that uh, we're only enabled as it's as it's described. We're only allowed to do this for the duration of the COVID nineteen pandemic, at least given our current um, the current status. Um, so we are uh, now we are now faced with a, a position where um, we're going to be at a point, hopefully very soon, where we're no longer in an emergency, which I think everybody is um, excited about. But with that, at least given what we currently understand, uh, will come the return of uh, physical in-person meetings. Unless um, there are a couple of changes that take place. Um, and so what I wanted to do, I don't have a policy uh, for you to adopt because the, again, the, the situation's changed this, this evening <laughs> uh, in terms of what the governor uh, would, would like to do uh, and, and the, the extension. So I don't, I don't wanna share a policy yet because we need to go back and rewrite it. Um, but we do have a question for the uh, for the council, which is, um, should we be enabled to meet virtually in the in the future? Uh, would the council want to do that either as um, either as a hybrid, you know, some some physical assembly, uh, some you know for quorum, for example, would you want to have a physical quorum be present in one location? Um, answer to that. Uh, may maybe that it's required uh, given uh, if, if the if the emergency ends and we just revert back to normal normal rules, or would we want to have um, virtual meetings continue if we're unable to do so, uh, including a quorum? Um, so the it, I throw that out there and I put it on the agenda 
hoping that we'd have the ability to provide a policy tonight, but since we don't have, um, since everything changed li literally 15 minutes before the meeting, um, I'd rather go back and, and look at it at the next meeting. So <laughs> I'll make sure that we're covered because uh, I think that there will probably be more changes even between now and next month. So, um, so I just wanted to throw that out there. See, a, is there what what the council's interest is in virtual meetings, and would you, if if we're able to meet uh, virtually, including as a quorum of of the members assembled, uh, would you want to do it that way? Uh, the alternative is physical meetings. Uh, you know, in meetings, we'd pick a location and it'd be open to the public, and just kind of be back to the way that things normally would have been, which is fine <laughs> uh, if you if you want to do that. But get you know, it. I personally like the idea of continuing virtual um, and maybe saying twice a year we convene in person or something like that, where those can be more extensive meetings when we're doing our year plans or, you know, our report or looking over our report and diving deep. Um, those might be in person just so we have, you know, the time together. But um, I think if we're trying to advance young people and recognizing the 20 million things that young people are expected to do and how to balance child care at 7 o'clock at night, who wants to hire a babysitter? You know, um, if you don't have to, and how much money does that cost? So, um, yeah, I, I personally would love to continue virtual if that's permitted per Virginia code and in the county. I could not agree more. And I think, you know, we've already had some issues with the quorum. I can see if we have to then throw in, you know, traveling to the government center and traffic and. Um, just different conflicts. I think it would just be much easier to continue the work we're doing. Um, and I think it's more accessible for other people who want to tune in. You know, um, they don't have to deal with traffic. That's a huge barrier for young people who want to participate in meetings like ours as well. The child care, the traffic, the time. So I would really love to support that. And if if it's not allowed by state code, you know, looking into some ways to lobby or whatever lack of a better word to get it the state code to change next year in the general assembly so i would agree with casey and denver i think just the flexibility and accessibility that the virtual option offers is just unparalleled compared to what it would be and the toll it would take uh, if we were required to show up and meet quorum physically so um, I, I think that this is just a much more convenient and honestly more effective option to not only enable more and more consistent participation, um, but it also affords more comfort too. So um, I would agree. Thanks. I, I agree. I mean, honestly, I, I, I would certainly like to meet all of you, though, at some point before our term runs out. Um, so. You know, I, I I definitely echo the sentiments that you know everyone has has given. Um, you know, my original preference would be some kind of hybrid, flexible version where if people wanted to be in person, they could, but people could also go online. Um, you know, I'm certainly conscious that there might be complications with that. I mean, but thankfully we are a relatively small group, so I don't think it would be you know too um, you know too too challenging or. Um, you know that we would run into too many problems with having having mixed mixed media, if you will. Um, you know, but but that being said, if if that's not you know the best option, if you know if it, I mean, because obviously the downside of that is there might be a chance that you know you don't ever meet everyone in person. Um, you know, and some and like obviously Graham, you know, you would have to be there. Um, and if only two other people show up, maybe that wouldn't be the best you know use of 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 your time. Um, just certainly conscious of that. So if you know if that's not amenable or the the best option, I'm I'm happy with what Denver proposed. And I also would suggest that we take a similar approach in our subcommittees. Uh, again, you know, I'm just thinking like it would be nice to actually meet some people in person, even if it's just once. Um, so yeah, that that's my 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 sentiments. Yeah, I really echo. Um... What everyone has said about accessibility, I honestly think that this should have been made possible before the pandemic started all the online meetings everywhere. Um, so, I think we can't afford to let ourselves go back and uh, regress to when every single meeting has to be in person. Um, so, I think it's really important from accessibility standpoint and accessibility standpoint for not just um, a disabilities rights, but young people like everyone's an intersectional problem. You know, so I really think that we should uh, keep and maintain. 
um, the online meeting infrastructure that everyone had to go to and, and rally for that as young people. Um, because it is really hard, like Denver said, and Casey said, and everyone has said already is that like, it is really hard as a young person to be everywhere you want to be because we're like our generation. we just have so many incredible challenges constantly. I also like what Denver uh, personally, I, uh, like Denver's idea for the young adult, the YAA at large about meeting twice a year in person and then online the rest of the year. But I also like Sarah's idea where the subcommittees meet in person. So, cause I think. But the subcommittees is where like the bulk of the work work is done. And I think uh, in person often fosters a more creative and collaborative environment. So I think if subcommittees can be in person more often, I think that'd be great. And maybe like the subcommittees can have a uh, virtual option. So that's kind of my take. Thanks. Uh, if I could share my two cents, I agree with mostly everyone else. Uh, I mean, I, I know I was afforded the luxury of living two minutes away from the governmental center. so. I don't want to give a biased answer, but I think uh, adopting some form of, of a hybrid would be nice. I think, like most of you, most of you said, I think it would be nice to meet people eventually in person. Not sure how many people have actually met other people on the call, but but yeah, some form of a hybrid would be really nice. I think, like uh, Deborah mentioned, some kind of maybe biannual or you know larger meetings that will have some more uh, collaborative collaborative effort. I think would be um would be beneficial. So, so that, yeah, I think that's the. Uh, a nice direction to go, you know, if 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 um they permit though, for sure. Feel feel free to bring our views back to uh back to the government, Graham. <laughs> uh this is this has been really helpful. I had a I had an inkling that this would be, you know, this is what the, the council would want to do. Um but yeah, we will uh, we're doing it for all the backs right now. There's I think a hundred and 90 of them or so, plus all of our various task forces that are public bodies. And so the consensus that we're getting on all the ones that I know of, at least, is that people are kind of, they're kind of used to this and they're, they kind of like it and see a lot of utility in it, even, even if we don't have, you know, the COVID pandemic going on. So um, I think that's pretty, I think there's a, a general consensus that this, it, it worked pretty well. So um, I will, I will definitely relay this um, and I'll, I'll talk to the county attorney's office about drafting up a policy, uh, given our enabling legislation and um, by the, by the next meeting, uh, which will be held. You know, we still have the, we still have the ability to meet in person in June. Um, we'll, we'll have a policy that's based on our, our latest understanding of the law. So thank you. Appreciate it. And we'll, I'll take all these into consideration um, and also also send it around uh, before we, uh, before we vote on it. So that we make sure that we have a you know a good understanding of timing and you know, subcommittee um, subcommittee participation, for example, and um, so we have something that's written up. Thank you. Appreciate awesome. it. Thank you. The next bit of our agenda, the not so fun bit. Um, per our last meeting, the council had adopted a policy um, regarding attendance to make sure that folks are meeting their obligations as council members. Um, and showing up to meetings, uh, the adopted policy was to put folks on notice when they net missed three meetings and then on the 4th to consider their removal. Um, last month, we put 2 members on notice, Muhammad Rahman and Lee Jackson. Um, after many attempts to get in contact with them to talk about their journey, you know, any personal, try to get some context. Um, Lee Jackson noted that time commitments has shifted and he formally resigned. Um, and there has not been a formal response from Muhammad Rahman. With that being said, I would entertain. So with that being said, Lee Jackson, we will go back to his appointing member, notify them of their resignation and ask for a new appointee like we have with Dini. So Dini, the whole thing is, you know, please don't miss three months in a row because that's quarter of the year. <laughs> um, life happens, you know, if, if major things happen, we understand we're really flexible. You can ask for an excused absence and we can talk about that. Um, and, and, you know, this is not a paying gig. This is not family, right? We're just doing the work of the county um, and you're fitting in your volunteer life. So we want to respect that. So just having that open conversation, um, just let us know in advance if you can attend, especially when we're trying to hit quorum, as you see tonight. We'll do. We'll do. Hopefully, it's yes. not a problem. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I mean, we try to be as understanding as flexible as possible. So if you contact us and we have a conversation, talk to contact Graham, like you're good. We're definitely. Yeah, good. life's unpredictable. 
Yes. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Um, so uh, we will be going to see if we can find a new person to fill Lee's spot. Um, but with that being said, having no response from Muhammad Rahman, that matters on the floor and I will entertain discussion and or emotion. And the motion could be to ask and formally remove him from the board to allow his appointing member the ability to appoint someone new. Um, I'm just going to chime in. I have a suggestion. I, I, I think, and I'm sure I'm not the only one that also um, is feeling the same, you know, just knowing that he's the one that helped get the board founded. Um, I think this is a really tough one. Um, would it be possible because of my understanding from, you know, comments he's made and, and from the way that, you know, we kicked off the yak in the beginning was that he was working with the board of supervisors to do it. Would it be possible to go back to his member and see if the member could contact him and get a steer? So we have, and he has not responded. I've called him about three or four times. Graham has contacted him and called him several times as well as texted. And the chairman's office has also not heard from him. We've been very exhausted with our efforts, which makes it even, even harder. Uh, I, I can move, I move that uh, we remove him from the board. You know, I think everyone should be held to the same standard regarding attendance and stuff. And these were the, these were the tennis requirements we discussed last time. So, yeah. Is there a second to that motion? I second the motion. All right. Is there any discussion? Hearing none, we'll close. Oh, I'll give you a few more seconds. Anyone? No. Okay. Um, then we'll open the floor to a vote. Um, do we need to do this? Or we can just do it in general. We don't need to do a roll call. So, all those in favor of um, removing Muhammad Rahman to um, have the chairman report to appoint another at large member, say aye. 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 All those opposed, say nay. Any abstentions? I abstain. Oh. I don't know. I don't know him enough to vote. <laughs> I understand. Um, so that is still. Should you, did you vote? Yeah, uh, I, I'm going to abstain as well. If you don't. Mm. What, can, can I ask? Well, uh, we might we can also talk offline, but would my vote affect the current? Uh, discourse of like whether or not he would he we would file for his removal of the other council. I need a parliamentarian because there yeah, are six of us. Clarify, yeah, and whether how many yays are needed in order to pass. So uh, I, my understanding is that if uh, if there's a split decision, that the motion fails. Right. Okay. So right now we have three yays, three abstentions. So as it sits, the motion would fail. Would anyone want to readdress their decision with that being made? I, I can vote yay. I uh, I agree with Jessica's comment, you know, that yes, everyone should be held to the same standard. And it does sound like you guys have exhausted it. I think, you know, I think if we do hear from him and there was some, you know, big life event that, you know, God forbid, um, you know, impacted it, we could revisit the matter then but I, I agree with jessica's comment on that and and i would uh, i would reiterate and this might this might help um our 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 ability is to recommend um we don't have the ability to uh, remove or not remove uh, or appoint members so this is just a recommendation so um, put, putting that out there just so that you're, you're aware um, so if there is something that you know, that is, uh, that's reasonable and that you know would invite him to come back um, that, Sorry. Sorry, did I interrupt someone? No, go ahead. Oh, okay. So I can't really tell because I'm on my phone. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, you know, to me, this is about being fair to all the members. Like this to me is nothing about whether I would vote for Mohammed in any sense or not. This is just, we, I think this board spent like two or three meetings already. Was well, so like two or three months, maybe three or four months, trying to figure out attendance and a fair policy, and there was a scores and debate on that. 
So, if one member who has had uh, a, a sort of, you know, accessibility to email and accessibility to receive notifications and the agenda has been sent out, I, I think this is a fair recommendation to make by the board uh, without um, it, which speaks nothing of Mohammed's accomplishments or contributions or what he's done. And like the fact that he even got this form in the 1st place, which is like incredible. But to me, I think this is just a matter of being fair to everyone by the rules that we all agreed on as a group. So. Absolutely. So, with a 4, 2 vote, it passes. We will make that recommendation to uh, chairman McKay. This does not come lightly. I mean, I have called. Extensively and emailed. Um, we got 1 text response that was not clear and we tried to follow up on that multiple times um, and did not get a response. So we know he's received um, communication from us. So, um, I thank you all. You know, for taking on this matter, hopefully this is the 1st and only time. God willing that we can do this once again, life happens. Just let us know. Um, I see you all as part of my activist family. So, um. I want to make sure we uplift you and give you opportunities and this is definitely not. Something I want to see as a regular thing for anyone. So, um. Thank you for your candor and, and we'll act on that appropriately. Just a, a question um, and, you know, forgive me. I, I might just misremember. Um, I know that last year, at least Lee and Mohammed both held um, positions. Do they hold any positions currently? So, um, Lee was elected to be vice chair um, since we just got his resignation yesterday or today. Um, we are uh, going to put out a notice to the rest of the board members that we're holding elections for vice chair. Um, Muhammad no longer holds a position because we combined the subcommittees. Yeah. And speaking of subcommittees. Dini, we have two, and where would you like to go? Perhaps we should describe what they are. <laughs> True. Yeah. Yeah. Flip a coin, flip a coin, figure it out. Um, so our planning and transportation uh, subcommittee is led by Casey Judge, who is one of our wonderful planners for Fairfax County. And they're looking at obviously transportation and planning and urban development issues um, in, in Fairfax County. We have the pleasure of um, doing a letter regarding the ZMOD recommendations. I don't know if you saw that YouTube video um, and, and you know, ensuring that you know, the new policies of Fairfax County passes um, is inclusive of all and uplifts young folks. And then we have um, our youth engagement and retention, which includes outreach and you know, civic engagement a uh, subcommittee uh, that's chaired by Shudik, um, and they focus on outreach education overall, how to keep folks in the county and how to make the county more um, attractive when it comes to services and whatnot for young people. So quick question, how does my um, my answer impact me? Is there certain meetings that separate the two groups or, or how does that work specifically? Yes, let me bring up the schedule or I don't know if you have it. Yeah, and then who leads the, the youth engagement and retention team? Okay. Yeah, so you would just become a subcommittee member, but I don't have the dates of when they meet. Well, I, I have I have them right here. So the dates we had identified since we we combined them at our last uh, meeting, we originally been looking at four subcommittees, and it's just, it's, it's too many, so we we combined them into two. Um, yeah. What we're going to do is for June um, to start them up um, the first Thursday of the month for the outreach um, the outreach meetings, uh, the outreach subcommittee, and then the second. Tuesday of the month for the, um, the infrastructure, so planning and transportation. Those are the the um, we did, we did a survey to see what would work for them, for most people. So, and they'd both be seven o'clock, seven p.m. So same time. Okay, and then terms uh, of the members upon each uh, subcommittee, is there an, uh, an imbalance between the two? Like, would there be a need for me on one uh, or either of the sides? Because I mean, of course, both of them are. You know, in their own ways, but so if there is like, you know, 1 side that maybe needed a more of a lift, then I could, you know, I reconsider that side. So, when the subcommittee is just made up of the 15 or 16 of us. It kind of splits down the middle, so we've, we've tried to okay. 
the focus, you know, kind of right brain, left brain, looking at at these two different two di two different issues. So, um, I think at this point we can probably put you on whichever one you whichever one you'd want. Oh. And we have a lot of flexibility with this, um, and so whatever you whatever you'd like to, and whatever piece you're interested in would probably be fine. Yeah. Well, I mean, I guess of the two, I would be more inclined for the youth engagement retention um, subcommittee. I think. Uh, you know, personally, that resonates a bit more, although plan transformation uh, does as well, considering there's so much being built in my specific district. But, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think um, youth engagement and retention would be the one that I would be more inclined to choose. Great choice, Dini. Welcome. I didn't want to try <laughs> and influence your thoughts before, but we're... We're glad to have you on board. Yeah, and with that point, the committee will have five votes um, so far. We see we get um, uh, uh, our teacher. Um, what is her name that I'm completely blinking on? Who the first meeting was last month to decide, um, and then our new appointees once we get them to. And then who is the lead for this um, so committee? I know you mentioned Casey for the other one. Or is there a lead for this subcommittee? She is. Could you repeat that, please? What What did you say? He wants to know who's the lead of the subcommittee. It's you. Yes. And <laughs> and as uh, and I think uh, Graham just just mentioned we're meeting on the first Thursday. Yeah. So. Sweet. I got a warm welcome from the lead. Nice. So that's so a high note for you. <laughs> Yeah, diving right in. So that just so everyone knows, so what we'll do is we'll send out uh, WebEx invites for each of these uh, in advance. And so we're looking at for the um, outreach that'll be on the third. So mark your calendars for the third, but I'll send around a WebEx invite. And um, for the transportation uh, and and planning infrastructure subcommittee, we need to come up with better names because uh, there's there's too many terms, too many nouns. Um, but that'd be looking at the eighth of June. Okay, that'll be our first order of business on the 8th, coming up with new name and a fun acronym to pair with it. So I like it. I like it a lot. <laughs> and then uh, if I could just add one more thing, um, um, just to let you know, I do know that I did fill the seat of my sister. I'm pretty sure most of you, uh, Najma is actually my sister. <laughs> you didn't oh, know yay! That. <laughs> That's awesome. So, so I don't want it to seem like there's any nepotism in the ranks. Um, I mean, we we grew up like you know doing some some uh, outreach work within the Somali American community as well with uh, Miss Gross. So I've had a relationship with her. Well, my mom has the real relationship. I'm just the kid, but um. So you know, she mentioned me the opportunity. I thought it would be great because you know she doesn't live here anymore. So now I am, uh, the one left in the Mason District region. So um, yeah, I just wanted to let that know. I feel like the majority of people would understand that. Um, but yeah, that that Majma was my sister. So any predisposed. Uh, uh, mindset, um, throw that out the window. <laughs> I am, uh, I don't, I don't know how, um, because I'm pretty sure the reason why she ended up having to leave was because she didn't end up moving from the area. I think that's what Penny mentioned to me. So, so yeah, we miss her at the house though. <laughs> we miss her in the committee or council, but we're happy to have you. And I'm sure she'll still bend your ear about a few things, which is great. Yeah, yeah, no, I get a lot of my info from her. She is well acclimated in the community. Funny story, I was in um, 10th grade and I was uh, in governor's, was it government? Yeah, no, it was a 10th grade history class. Uh, probably was government. And um, my teacher put up uh, for um, Terry McAuliffe, the, uh, you know, the district person to reach out to. And it was her name on the Blackboard page. And I just thought it was hilarious that I didn't mention to anyone that it was my sister's name. <laughs> But um, so I know she's been she's been involved uh, quite a bit. So I definitely get my local uh, area politics from her. So awesome! Well, welcome, Dini. You know, <laughs> um, so I'm also on the youth outreach committee. So I wanted to confirm, uh, Sujit. So we're meeting the first Thursday of every month. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah, I know Graham and I went back a few times about finding the kind of the optimal meeting time because people had different schedules and I think we landed on the first uh, Thursday of the month. Is that is that good with you? Is that work for your schedule? 
Uh, yeah, yeah, it should. I just need to uh, confirm, but yeah, that should be no problem. So that's me first Thursday at 7 p.m. Correct. All right, cool. Great. Well, Dini, we're really excited to have you on team. Welcome, welcome. Um, none of us, I mean, I know Jessica from other ways, but the rest of us, I don't think any of us have met each other outside of Casey and Graham who work together. Um, so hopefully we all get to see each other eventually. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, excited to have you on board and ready to, you know, lead on your expertise and insights to make better changes in the county. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to it. Today was a great presentation as well, so it's nice for me to kick it off. Emu will forever have a place in my heart. Good. All right. Is there any other business before the board? Any new business or announcements? Um, Harry. Oh. One, one, one quick thing. Um, Amy's Amy's presentation got me thinking in terms of just kind of the structuring of our um, recommendations. I think somebody had asked. Um, Asked the question, maybe it was Casey asked the question about timing for, for the strategic plan. And I, I think that, that was a really important thing to ask because, you know, I think uh, Dini, one of the things that we've been able to do as a, as a group has been to provide recommendations pretty quickly on matters that were presented on. And so if there's interest in having Amy either come back, you know, whether to, whether to a subcommittee meeting or to, to this, this council, you know, to the full body um, to do you know, follow up discussions um, after after folks have had a chance to take a deep dive into the strategic plan. Um, just let me know because um, it sounds like we'll want to do that pretty quickly for the summer so that so that we can get you know a formal if if we want to do a formal recommendation uh, on it uh, that we could do so in a. You know. So I think um, Jessica definitely snatched the question um, that I was going to ask as well about you know how do you plan to reach you know on the ground level in the community. So um, you know. I think her reaching out to us with more of the documentation to figure out, you know, what's really going on in that area, I think will be nice. Cause I think um, the recommendations would be, uh, you know, better based off, you know, what they already have in place. So um, in terms of that, like, is that typically how it goes when you guys have presenters, um, they'll eventually send over documentation or if, you know, upon request, and then we go ahead and, you know, reach out to them personally, or would we reach out to you if we have, so for example, Amy, if I have recommendations, would I reach out to you, Graham, or, um, you know, reach back to her, uh, personally. Yeah, I think of me as kind of the conduit. So if you have particular particular perspectives, after you've taken a look through any of the documentation for, you know, either the strategic plan or future presentations, um, just send it to me. Um, one of the things with uh, with the FOIA rules is that um, we need to keep communications through uh, through the staff. It's just kind of the, the way that it works, but I'm able to then send out anything that, for example, to the rest of the council, if you wanted to provide their input, um, get their input on on a perspective, um, or if you wanted to compile it, uh, if we wanted to compile ideas, for example, regarding the strategic plan into one document, um, I'm, I'm kind of your guy. I can help you help put that together, and, and we can think through that, um, so that we can then Perfect. put together a letter. I'm Sounds wondering good. if we, you know, if we can send our own thoughts um, as we get the time to go through the strategic strategic plan, but maybe what if we set by like. Our July meeting, we set to have a discussion to make a recommendation that we can vote on, or we set to have a letter that can be voted on by then. That gives enough time that if we want to bring back topic specific, you know, uh, pieces of the plan to our subcommittee groups, we'll have some time. So I know I saw housing, I know I saw transportation, um, and I feel like we would really like to have uh, a more in depth overview of what the strategic plan goals are on those specific topics that are subcommittee meetings. So. I don't, know, I don't know if you guys think that sounds like a a general plan. Oh, my cat is participating. <laughs> I'm gonna mute myself so, before he keeps meowing into my microphone. <laughs> sounds good to me, and uh, definitely, I think our homework between now and our subcommittee meetings is just to personally take a look, and we can add that to the docket, um, and just have our own personal thoughts. So I appreciate that. It's a great plan. And I will forward the presentation that Amy uh, gave to us um, after the call so that everybody has it. All right, any other business or announcements? All right, get your strategic plan on y'all um, and we'll see you soon. Oh, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. Seconded or 
Yeah. We still move. Yeah. Okay, I, I move it. I'm sorry. I need to remember this. <laughs> <laughs> and is there a second? <laughs> second. Second. All right, that's a non debatable. Second. So, congratulations. Good night. Um, we'll see you online soon and welcome, Dini. Happy to have you. Thank you. Everyone have a good night. Thank you all. Good night.